Yeah, good morning. My name is Jim Struvy, and I'm executive director of Ben Healing. Uh, to begin our session today, I want to take a brief moment to honor that each of us assembled here via Zoom are doing so from some physical location that has been inhabited by indigenous ancestors before ourselves. As we engage in our work to end sexual violence in 2020, we must not overlook that the land we occupy has history and retains the memory of violence and trauma that has been experienced by previous generations of indigenous people. In remembering them, we honor their spirits and the rich legacies they have left behind. By engaging in heal healing work here at the Script Conference, we must remain committed to also give back to the land and add to a legacy of love and deep connection. Let us take a moment of silence to honor our indigenous ancestors. Thank you. There are 200 men standing in our studio audience right now. Each one is holding a picture of themselves at the age when they say they were first sexually abused. These courageous men are standing together to lift the veil of shame today because what happened to them as young boys has profoundly affected who they have become as men. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a boyfriend. I'm a grandfather of seven. I work for child welfare. I work for the federal government. The sexual abuse started when, when I, I was, was sexually four. assaulted at 16. I was raped at the age of 14. I was six. I was 12. I was seven. I was sexually abused my entire childhood until I was 18. The topic is taboo, surrounded by stigma and shame. It's a silent and devastating epidemic with numbers that are really staggering. It's estimated that one in every six men has been molested as a child, one out of six. That is from an Oprah show that was done in the fall of 2010. And there were 200 men in the audience who were all male survivors. Uh, still really powerful to watch that. Um, I was in the audience that day. Uh, Jordan, who's here, was in the audience that day. It really represents the power of story. Um, one of the things that's so clear is that male survivors are still largely invisible, largely isolated. Um, and what Oprah did was she had a national audience to put right on her lap in her face the reality of male sexual victimization. I was really honored. I helped to assemble the 200 men who were there that day. Um, we were contacted to help assemble the audience. And Oprah paid all the expenses, lodging, travel, everything, to get everyone there. And when she began to interview the men, she was so moved that she decided to change from doing one program to changing and making two. And so there was a two-part series. So we accommodated her desire and stayed longer to help her do a second show. Uh, but it really did, it kind of changed the national dialogue. And what it really also did was it put, um, it kind of changed the way in which we need to work with men. Uh, it put a human face to male survivors and it provided a way for people to hear stories of male survivors, not just statistics and data and information. It was a program that we processed through our feelings, not just our cognitive brains. Um, so I'll just take a second as we come together here today to, to see it's so important to know the story or the kind of demographics of the people when we're together. And so we had three questions that uh, if you check your polling function, um, 
we just want to see where everybody is in the audience. But uh, the first question is, for those of you who are service providers, do you have professional experience working with one or more you know, survivors? Looks like for any of you that didn't vote, take a second. So it appears almost two thirds of our audience has experience. And do you have a personal contact with a male survivor? Interesting, 92% of you here know someone. And for those of you who are males, are you a male survivor? So almost a quarter of the audience is that. Again, one in six men are survivors, so we're in each other's midst. Um, let me just tell you briefly about myself and my story and how I came to be and what we're gonna uh, be focusing on uh, today. My story ab about this journey uh, in ter for conscious awareness <laughs> began in 1976 when I accidentally got a job working for child welfare and got promoted into child protective services. And so because there's mostly a female staff, I very quickly began to work with the males. And for a bunch of years in child protective services and residential and in the hospital, um, I worked with boys and men who were sexual um, victims. And I went back to school and got my MSW. And I had devoted my career to this field. And in the process, one night in 1982, six years after I had started first working with this and being immersed in the profession, one night in group, I heard a man talking about his story and it flashed past my eyes as that was my story too. And because my childhood had been so pervasive and so common, I just assumed it was normal. And it never even occurred to me that what happened to me was sexual victimization. Here I was 30 years old, working in the field for six years, and it was story that prompted me to see that's me too. And what that did is it is really catalyzed me into, okay, I guess if I'm gonna work with this, I better do my own work. But I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't find anybody except for maybe a peer that was in doing this. So kind of the, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a dog with a bone and I don't let go. And so I said, I am going to change this. And about 30 years old, I said, this is the rest of my life. This is not gonna to happen to someone else. And so now for 45 years, I've been a um, social justice warrior for this issue. And um, kind of the short version is part of the thing to change uh, the trajectory. In 1988, myself and two other colleagues, we decided to take about having an add-on day to a sexual offenders conference to gather together people for a summit to talk about non-offending male survivors since 1988. And 200 men showed up. And so with that, we decided that we would, the next year in Atlanta, which is where I was living, we would go ahead and do a um, standalone conference. Uh, and at that conference, the next year, 450 people from 14 countries showed up. And so we were off and running. We kept meeting, kept doing conferences. By 1995, formed a national organization just to work on this issue. And then by uh, 2001, we started doing three-day uh, healing weekends of recovery. And um, this coming weekend, we will be doing our 80th weekend event. So we've been doing it for a while now, lots of people coming through. In 2017, the weekend recovery format, uh, program we reformatted as Men Healing. So we've now been operating under that umbrella since then. And one of the things that we have done is the Oprah program and the catalyst that that had uh, in terms of generating people coming forward, we've really taken a committed effort that a lot of our work is gonna be around story and that we wanna help men be empowered to share their stories and we want them to spread the word to inspire other men. So what we've kind of done, part of the, part of the nuts and bolts of our organization is uh, in our weekends, we try to create safety for men to tell their story in a really structured, safe way. Some of them have never had a chance to do that before. And we model what it's like to be listened to as you tell your story. We started a video project where we're helping men, three guys who are here sharing 
the program today are all part of that to publicly share their stories. And what we're learning um, is that two things. One, in 2020, all these years after I started doing the work, all these years after Oprah, male survivors are largely still invisible and therefore feel isolated. And what we're realizing is what's changing the trajectory, hopefully, is not again the cognitive facts and figures and it's the stories. It's the stories. And so we're really, really committed to using story to um, through our Beyond Survival video series, which you'll see some today as we go through with community forums, um, et cetera, that stories are gonna wanna make men realize they can get help too. And the stories are not about all the trauma or what happened, but about hope and healing. And I think you'll see as you watch some of the videos we're gonna share with you today, our desire is to inspire. And what I'm hoping we can do is create a whole cadre of, um, war, of social justice warriors going out and not being afraid to talk about their experience and inspiring others. So one thing I want to acknowledge is the four of us on this particular presentation, we are all white. We have to be transparent and above board and own that we're all white. Um, however, our focus on stories and our focus on our organization is that we're committed um, to not only learn from the diverse ways that people choose to tell stories, all the rich traditions of how people tell stories, there's lots of ways and we're trying to incorporate all that into our work so that it's not just done one particular lens. Our organization, we have a diversity of staff, board and support staff around race, gender, sexuality. And as an organization, we're committed to being social justice oriented, to being anti-racist in our mission and to be collaborative amongst ourselves and with other organizations. So we, we want to model nonviolence, hope and healing, and respectful relationships. Um, one of the things I want to just build on, Deborah yesterday made the comment that we have to be aware that individual actions have a ripple effect. And I wanted to share, this is something I, I say at every weekend that we have for the story. As the men are gathered in a room, we'll be 28 men, and we'll do something, and I always tell them this, story based on having learned this from the Buddhist monk, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. He talks about up in the sky, there's water in the clouds, just little drops of water. And one drop of water at a time falls to the earth, just one drop. And as one drop falls, if it meets one or two other drops, it becomes a puddle. And if a puddle is fortunate enough to have some other drops come down and join them, they become a stream and streams begin to have movement, and streams flow, and they begin to find their path. And streams always generally find a river, and then rivers gather force. And rivers have the idea to be a lake, or a flowing stream, or a flowing river, maybe rapids, maybe calm, and eventually all the rivers reach the ocean. And the ocean is this huge force and energy and it, so much of our earth is built around the power and the energy of the earth. And that is just drops of water that have found their way. The four of us here are four drops of water and our stories will hopefully contribute to finding the way. We have 63 people on this call, 63 more drops of water and all the people who aren't here. So I wanna take that model in terms of our stories and how we can can make change and not underestimate that we may just be one of us at a time, but we're not one of us because we have shared collaborative force and power. So now just one last thing as we prepare for the presentation. Um, I also wanna say, and I'm gonna introduce Jordan in one second here, is that as we were putting this presentation together and wanting to do it in some non-traditional ways uh, to do it, we began to share our stories. We all four know each other in some regard. But as we were sharing our stories, we were really aware of how we were uncovering the various ways, the various ways in which our lives overlapped and were linked. We had things in common. And then we began to find ways that our lives had crossed paths without even knowing it in some ways. 
And so we're going to weave that some into here because interesting that kind of we have sharedness in the world just because of stories. It's not because we were sitting down being men talking about our this, that, and the other. It's because we revealed ourselves and in our vulnerability we find commonness. So that's part of what I hope you'll take away today so that we can hopefully change the invisibility of male sexual victimization and show the power of hope and healing. So Jordan, I'll pass the torch to you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and thanks, Deborah, for inviting us here to script. Um, it's, uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jordan. Um, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Um, I, so we're here to talk to you basically about story. Um, and my healing journey personally really began well with just that, a, a story. Um, the trauma I endured as a kid, the details aren't necessary, but they manifested um, as a teen into some horrible, horrible things. I was drug addicted, uh, prostitute, self-harm, all the worst things you can think of. <clears throat> I basically had to choose. Do I continue living this way and likely die early in that process? Or do I search for something more? So when I was 20 years old, I decided I was going to do that search and I searched and I searched and I always came up short. The services I could find, I was living in Toronto at the time, were only for women and children. And this devastated me because I felt like this idea continued to inst um, instill in me that I was one in a million, <clears throat> that my story didn't matter, that I didn't deserve to be heard or to be helped. Um, and it was really out of this desperation that I came up with an idea that in hindsight was kind of ingenious. Um, I, someone needed to hear, I needed someone to hear my story. So I wrote it down, pen and paper, I wrote it down. Um, not all the crazy details, but uh, at the end, there was about five pages, uh, lined paper with blue ink. I folded it up, I stuffed it in an envelope and I wrote, please read me on the front of the envelope. <clears throat> I went, I did, went on the subway. I discreetly sat, uh, put the letter onto one of the seats and I sat across from it and I waited. About 10 minutes later, the subway stopped at a station. A middle-aged woman got on, got on. She sat beside my letter and she just kept looking at it. And I watched her and then she picked it up. She opened it and she began to read it. And as I watched her read it, I saw tears come down her cheeks. And then I knew someone was finally listening to my story and it changed my world. <clears throat> and then the, the beginning of my healing story started. When I found the Weekend of Recovery program, um, I was skeptical. I thought all the men that were gonna be, I was gonna walk in there, it was gonna be a weirdo. I wasn't gonna be able to relate to anybody. They all be crazy. But when I stepped through those doors, the first, time, the first time to meet everyone, there was this instant relief, um, this instant connection, and I knew I was going to be heard and understood. And then, so now going back to the Oprah show that uh, we showed earlier and Jim was speaking about, when I was approached about appearing on that uh, special episode of Oprah, I was 100% all in. At that point in my recovery journey, I had already become comfortable enough to share parts of my story. I was doing some public speaking and some outreach on male survivorship. And this seemed like a golden opportunity to continue that. But my scope of these things was still tiny. And I felt like we, like male survivors, were this niche group of people. And boy, did that change when we showed up to Chicago to go on the show. Uh, Oprah blew the lid off these things. A celebrity of her stature and her reach doing back-to-back -back episodes on male survivors' stories, it was incredible. And it wasn't just me and the small community I was used to anymore. It was male survivors were being featured on international television with one of the most influential people in the world. <clears throat> and my entire outlook completely changed. I was no longer part of this, what I thought was a small and marginalized community. I was part of this huge brotherhood, this worldwide brotherhood. <clears throat> and our stories were finally going to be heard. The experience for me was transformative. 
um, I pretty instantly turned into an advocate and like Jim said, a soldier for this cause. Um, I left Chicago, oh, that was like 10 years ago now with a purpose. Um, I left Chicago with a purpose to not only continue my healing, but to also spread that awareness uh, to as many people as I could. And I did that and I became a pretty successful and passionate advocate and public speaker in the field, um, working with tons of organizations in Canada, First Nations people, um, the Ontario Provincial Police. Uh, and <clears throat> we, we, we done good. Like we, we did a good job. Uh, in 2014, we were awarded a medal by the Queen um, for our uh, service to the country, the group that we had put on conferences. And it was just more validation that what we were doing, the fight that we are fighting was worth it. And it just pushed me further. So without this Oprah show exposing all of these stories, I wouldn't have gone on to do this. I wouldn't be here right now talking to you guys. So it just speaks to the power of, of something like that. In, the, in, in these situations, like when someone that powerful in the media can promote what we are doing, <clears throat> it just speaks volumes. Um, and with that, I'm gonna give it over to Drew, who wasn't at the Oprah show, but was watching the Oprah show. Drew? Thanks, Jordan. Um, thanks for sharing your stories. I, some things you've shared uh, just now are new things that I didn't know about you. So um, thank you for sharing. Um, I remember that night like it was yesterday, the night that I first watched the Oprah show. Um, it had been 13 years since I had been abused the first time and two years since my perpetrator had been released from a 10 year prison sentence. Um, and I had still not addressed head on how my childhood abuse had really affected me. I wanted to believe that it hadn't affected me, that I was strong enough um, to, to not have to dive deep into that. In other words, I was living in denial, no doubt influenced by growing up in a very lonely and stifling family in which emotions took a back seat and family image was everything. You only think you're gay because of that man, I remember my mom telling me years later. Um, with no one to safely turn to, uh, my abuse continued to haunt me into my 20s. And like many of my generation, I turned to the internet it was on YouTube late that night, four years ago, that I saw a video titled 200 Molested Men Come Forward. It was the first time that I remember feeling seen and heard, and I empathized and identified deeply with these men, their stories, and their struggles to reconnect and overcome what had been done to them. Little did I know it at the time, but this was really the beginning of my healing journey and of the hope that healing was even possible for me. Go ahead, Sam, and roll the video. It's not playing. Sorry about that, just a sec. It's okay. It's, I just wanna let you know it's frozen. Okay, share computer sound. Screen sharing has failed to start. That's a new one. Okay. Let's try one more time. Wait. Uh, 
I am Drew Stelter. How about now? We good? Okay. Yeah, it just the, the the issue of having been abused came up in my therapy, and when it did come up, it was just as like a passing. By the way, this happened to me, and then it kind of really took hold. And whether I wanted to or not, I had to look at it. I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> it was kind of staring me right in the face at that point. Parts of my healing has been learning to accept and feel and tolerate the positive feelings. Um, my abuse really robbed me of the experience of feeling joy. Has been one of those people that if there's something I love I have to share it and uh, it's been really great to attend the weekends of recovery uh, because there's a sense of brotherhood and community there that I've not felt in many places and being able to share my story with those brothers and hearing their stories um, I still feel connected to them you know, just that feeling of I'm, I'm not alone in this. And that healing isn't, there's no end destination. There's no final destination. And healing is an ongoing process. And um, integrating it into my life has been really important. A lot of self-care. I think I'm more me than I ever have been. And going through the healing process is, absolutely vital to that it's just a revelation to me and I'm continually surprised by how much I like myself and I didn't always see uh, see that In January, on my birthday, I told myself, I am going to go skydiving by the end of June. And June 29th or something, I went skydiving. Oh. And that felt so free. And I couldn't help but think of the parallels with, with uh, the healing process. I remember thinking, gosh, the minute I tell somebody that I was abused, like, it's just... I'm just going to fall right out of the airplane without a parachute and just drop and crash. So you're on that precipice, right? And jumping is the hardest part. And the, and the ride is actually kind of enjoyable sometimes, <laughs> and it's beautiful. And I think I would do it again. <laughs> All right. That's the first time I've actually seen that since I filmed it, I think maybe a couple of years ago. Um, kind of a, a, an interesting experience for me right there. Um, but from that Oprah episode, um, I was connected to male survivor and to men healing. Um, and to my surprise, I had discovered that uh, the Weekends Have Recovery had been held about 20 minutes away from my home for many years. And I had no idea that this organization even existed. And so watching the Oprah show, going to the, the resources that were provided and, and figuring out that this was 20 minutes away from my home, I felt like the luckiest person in the entire world. Um, I signed up that night, paid my fee, signed up. It was gonna be in three or four months and I went and I never looked back. Um, and it was at my first weekend of recovery that I shared my story for the first time. And even though I was surrounded by a small group of safe people who held me emotionally, the shame was still very palpable. 
And since that weekend, four years ago, I've been invited by Men Healing to share my story again and again and again in a variety of venues and projects such as this one. And what Oprah had said on that episode was tr proven true. When you speak your truth, you take away the shame of what happened to you. I can now share my story at events such as this one without feeling shame. And I am so proud of myself and how far I've come. I consciously choose to own and use my voice to protect myself and others. And I refuse to allow anybody else to write my story for me. Sharing my story has helped me to take my power back. Um, now I will hand it over to Jim. So I hope what you can see is emerging that our intention of, of finding ways to share our stories to impact other men in the world also has impact on the individuals who are sharing their story. And just the transformative process uh, of being able to do that. Jordan, Sam, and Drew were part of the initial wave of us launching this trial project of doing these videos. We now have 11 videos <clears throat> fully posted and some work uh, in process. And what we're seeing again is <clears throat> in terms of outreach, it's humanizing the issue. It, the, the stories are compelling. They're joyful, like jumping out of an airplane, if you find that joyful. Uh, but they're inspiring if nonetheless that you can take risks and try fabulous things. Uh, to do it. So that's what we want to keep modeling. And what we're beginning to find and hope is that men who are afraid to tell anyone, the average length of time for most men to disclose is 20 years. But for men to tell anyone, to seek help, to try to get someone to uh, work with them is so scary for so many men. And we're trying to inspire men to realize the joys of healing. And two other things that we're weaving into this, which is really helpful maybe to say here, is that we also need to, in the process with these stories, challenge toxic masculinity. Because all the norms of toxic masculinity are one of the things that have shut down the issue for males, male survivors. And with that one thing that we're very clearly doing now, very actively in the last few years, is we're challenging the medical model paradigm of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. What is totally unbalanced about that is if you witness a shooting, if you are privy to a car accident, et cetera, you're not disordered. And yet we treat survivors as if they're disordered. We pathologize survivors, we blame them. And what we really need to do is to shift the frame, the paradigm, it's injury, 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 not disorder. Post-traumatic stress, injury. And if we approach male survivors, all survivors in that regard, um, that changes the whole trajectory as well. So we're trying again to show in these stories that people are healing from injury, people are recovering to inspire other people to hire from injury. And by humanizing it, not pathologizing it, um, that we hope is gonna make a big difference. And the stories allow us to talk about that. You didn't see so far, and you're gonna see more, I'm gonna pass it to Sam in a second, but Drew is not a disordered person. Jordan is not a disordered person. I'm not a disordered person. Sam's not a disordered person, but we sure were injured. We sure were injured. And that's what we want to work with, because you can heal from injury, and there's hope. So with that, let me pass it on to Sam, because Sam has a very interesting story. Just take one second to pull it up here. My name is Sam Katz, that's S-A-M-K-A-T-Z. 
I am uh, newly married. I've, I've been married about a year and a half to to my wife, Elise. She's amazing. And right before we got married, I think, I want to say two weeks before our wedding day, I had the opportunity to attend uh, the Weekend of Recovery, which is this amazing uh, retreat. The healing that I experienced there was transformative. On my wedding day, I was able to be completely present and open, and I was able to receive this tremendous outpouring of love shown to me by all of our friends and family um, that came to Whidbey Island, Washington from all over the country, and they were there to celebrate us. Before that day, I'd heard a lot of people say, oh, my wedding was the best day of my life. And I always kind of thought that was a figure of speech, but then I experienced it. It was, it was a perfect day in every way. to feel that in a way that I hadn't been able to uh, for a long time. I think that really was what was taken from me when I was abused was this ability to feel and to be vulnerable and open to those emotions and to show those emotions, you know, and share that with other people. On my wedding day, it was like 180 degrees opposite of that. You know, I, I, I felt and was able to really experience every ounce of joy that was in that day. And it was just, I'm so grateful. You know, that was, uh, that was the best day of my life. Ooh. <laughs> I've seen that video a lot of times, but uh, something about seeing it in this format really got to me. I'm like, I know my, my parents are on here and my wife is on here and <laughs> I'm like watching them go through this experience of watching this video all together and it feels really special. Um, I remember the day that I shared that video on my personal Facebook page for the first time. Um, I was at work, I was, in, I was in my shared office and I was about to break for lunch and my heart was in my throat. I was writing and rewriting a post that was gonna accompany the video and I was so nervous that I actually started to feel a little dizzy. And, you know, I'd seen the video at that point. I had told my story, my survivor story to a camera. I would told parts of my story to family and friends. I'd even spoken at a public event, but this was like everybody I personally knew, coworkers, extended family, friends, et cetera, was about to find out if they didn't already know that I was a survivor of sexual abuse. And, um, for better or worse, mostly for worse, I think. I'm a person who cares a lot about what other people think about me. And the story that I was telling myself around this was, you can't control how people are gonna react. 
they might think less of you. They might see you as weak. They might say, you're making this up for your own gain or why are you airing your dirty laundry? Um, even though I had such positive experiences sharing my survivor story so far, it just like, for me, that's such a powerful personal example for me of like how powerful these stigmas are and how, uh, how much power these stories we tell ourselves have over us. Um, and they're coming from a place of fear, right? But I knew fear by then I knew that it was there to protect me and that it had served its purpose and that I didn't want to be a hostage to it anymore. I didn't want to be walking around hiding this thing. It's not shameful to be a survivor of sexual abuse, but I was still acting like it. And that acting costs energy. And I felt like it was limiting the possibilities that I was open to. Um, I felt like it was limiting what I considered myself capable of. So I took a deep breath. I grounded myself. I asked for courage and I hit that big blue button and set myself free. Um, that's how I ended up here today. Um, just going to pull up some slides I have here. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is why stories like this matter so much for male survivors of sexual abuse. Um, because a lot of male survivors uh, struggle to be open about their abuse, right? They feel closed off, isolated, alone. Um, and telling your story is the antithesis of that. It's openness, it's freedom, it's connection, it's love. That's why sharing my survivor story felt so cathartic. I didn't have to like hide anymore. I didn't have to feel ashamed. I didn't have to feel alone. You know, all of us attending this conference work in different fields. We have different experiences. We have different perspectives, but we share the goal of ending stigma around being a male survivor of sexual abuse. And what our group is here to tell you today is that one of the most effective ways that you can end that stigma is to truly listen to a male survivor's story. And then if you have the means and the person's permission, amplify it. When survivors feel really listened to and understood, they feel less shame, they feel less alone. And when other survivors see that person's story and connect with it, then they might feel less alone. And then they might feel compelled to seek help or share their story. It's this beautiful ripple effect. And I think, you know, Jim's story and Jordan's story and Drew's story that we've heard up until this point, like reflect that. And, and all the while, you know, people who aren't survivors are starting to see more of these stories and the subject of abuse becomes less taboo. It becomes more normal. And so little by little survivors of abuse start to feel less afraid and more comfortable seeking help and sharing their story because there is less societal stigma. And this conference is a beautiful way of, uh, of amplifying those stories. So thank you, um, Dr. Warner, for having us here. Um, so I think we can all agree at this point that stories are incredibly powerful, um, especially in the context of male survivorship. But I'm also a corporate and nonprofit documentary filmmaker. So I wanted to ground some of what we're talking about today in a little more concrete way so that all of you can leave this thing feeling like you have a better understanding of why stories are so good at engaging people and how they transport us into experiences outside of our own. Um, just a brief disclaimer, I don't consider myself a storytelling expert. I do have some knowledge and experience telling stories in a pretty specific area, but um, just like Jim alluded to earlier, there's so many kinds of storytelling. It's like stories are as ancient as humanity um, and so what we're, th the kind of stories and storytelling we're talking about today are just a narrow slice of that huge pie. So what is a story? I'm actually asking you, <laughs> I'd like for, um, for you to write it in the chat. What do you think is a story? Anyone? There are no wrong answers here. 
narrative, your truth. Collection of content and emotion, narrative and emotional backing, a sharing of one's personal experience, beginning, middle and end. Yes, these are all great definitions. A way of understanding a piece of who you are. Oh, I'm loving these. Sharing your experience. Yes, all of these are great definitions of story. Um, they inform and bring up hidden feelings, yes. So um, a really easy one from a very basic standpoint uh, is kind of your textbook definition. A story is the retelling of events often from a single perspective. And that's from Patrick Moreau who um, who's uh, founded this organization, Muse Storytelling. It has informed a lot of my uh, work in, in, in video production and um, the way that I think about story. Um, so I woke up, ate breakfast, wondered what I'm doing with my life and fell asleep on the couch. That's a pretty crappy but typical quarantine story, okay? That's, that's a story nonetheless. So we hear and, and see and tell these all day long. When, when you're talking to your partner or your mom or your friend, when you binge watch Stranger Things, when somebody describes their business, um, Robert McKee calls stories, uh, he, he's this um, screenwriter, kind of like guru, he calls them the currency of human contact. So, so we're immersed in stories. <laughs> Michael, story of my life, yes. Yeah, me too, man, me too. Um, so why are stories so good at engaging people? Um, well, we have some research that tells us why they're so good at engaging people. Uh, we're wired for them. So um, this guy named Paul Zak, he has done a lot of research around, around story and he showed that when we relate to a character in a story, our brains release a chemical called oxytocin, which some of you may have heard of. Um, it's a chemical that's associated with empathy and connection. And he also showed that this forged connection makes it far more likely for a person to care about a cause and take action. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. So again, just bringing it back to this bigger picture, why was storytelling more effective at reaching survivors than data? Empathy, right? That's what I want, that's what I want to bring it back to. Data by itself can't do that, but st a story around the data, contextualizing the data can do that. Um, so uh, another thing about stories is they strengthen the connections between the left and right sides of your brain. So, in other words, they help you connect your creativity, your emotions, and your rational thinking. This helps us absorb and retain and integrate information into our lives. So thinking back to the Oprah segment, um, the story that they create around that statistic one in six, that helps you retain that statistic, that, help, that makes it feel really important. So stories are also a really useful learning tool if you ever need to teach someone something. Um, and there's a lot more fascinating science about this, but suffice it to say that um, compelling stories result in narrative transportation, uh, which is where you lose your sense of self and become fully immersed in the world of the story. So I think we've all experienced this. Just think about the last time that you were very powerfully emotionally affected by a film or a TV show or a book. So like for me, the film Call Me By Your Name comes to mind. In my mind, that's like one of the great films of the last two decades. And um, I was a blubbery mess by the end because I was so transported. I was narratively transported by the characters. And I kind of, I, I lost my sense of samness a little bit. I felt like I was Elio and Oliver, like, like I was feeling how deeply they loved one another. And I was recognizing that powerful emotion as the way that I felt when I fell in love with my wife. So I want you to think of the last story that you experienced uh, and that made you temporarily lose your sense of self and feel something, just feel something and share that in the chat. Could be a TV show, could be a book, could be a movie. Um, I want you to share something that made you, that, that narratively transported you. Um, from a philosophical perspective, McKee, this, this kind of screenwriting guru that I mentioned earlier, uh, wrote one of the seminal books on screenwriting called Appro Aptly Story. He says that um, stories are our best effort to make sense out of the anarchy of existence. I love this quote. 
because um, you know what it's getting at is that stories give us a a sense of control, a, a sense of meaning. You know, right now we're in the midst of a global pandemic. We feel very out of control. Yeah, hands down. Um, yeah, exactly. It gives us, um, yeah, they're comforting in that way. They give us something to hold on to. And they also make us want to take action. So just when we connect with somebody who's going through something painful, for instance, we want to prevent them from going through that pain. So just coming back to Paul Zach's research for a moment, he also showed that people are more likely to give money to a cause once they have experienced a powerful story that affected them emotionally. And I'm loving the examples that are coming in the chat, a conversation you had with a Vietnam vet. Yes. A uh, song by Eve called Love is Blind, Gravity, Normal People. Oof. yes. Oh, that's my parents. Yes, normal people did that for me. That was amazing. Obama's eulogy for John Lewis. Yes, dating on the spectrum. Also, yes, man in the high castle. I'm, I'm going to have to check some of these out. Um, so how do... Uh, a great stories transport us. Um, I want to just like break this down a little bit um, so that you can start to identify how, how stories are really functioning. So they use, the first thing that any great story does is it, is it uses a compelling character or compelling characters. And so there's three major character elements that I want you to look for. Uh, desire, uniqueness, and motivation. So what does this person want beyond what they already have? That's desire uniqueness, what makes this person different from other people, and motivation, what is the deeper why behind their desire? In other words, why do they want that thing beyond what they already have? Um, and of the three, I just want to say desire is by far the most important. A compelling character must have a strong burning desire to get something or accomplish something that they don't yet have. Um, that is strongly associated with narrative transportation. Um, also, much like survivorship, great storytelling hinges on a central conflict and going on a journey to overcome that conflict. So in the context of survivorship, I think there's kind of a misconception that a lot, that, that has to be um, the abuse itself. I want to dispel that myth. It could be, but many times it's not. Many times it's um, the lasting effects down the line. Could be physical or mental symptoms. It could be fear of rejection by the survivor's community or family it could be a different stigma. So think about how this plays out in Drew's story or in mine, right? We want something beyond what we already have. In my case, it was the ability to feel my emotions again. So the conflict was all the emotional baggage from my abuse blocking my ability to feel. So I went on a journey, right? I overcame that baggage Going to the weekend of recovery was a huge step on that journey. And then on my wedding day, I was finally able to feel again in a powerful, cathartic way. So, so be looking for that in, when, when, you're, when you're looking at great stories. The other thing that great stories will do is they start with a hook. So audiences, you know, unfortunately, um, the world we live in is one where there's a lot of different things competing for our attention. And um, you know, great stories, one thing that they often do very well is they give us a reason to keep watching or reading or listening right off the bat. Why should we care about this thing? Why should we wa keep watching this thing? It should be, um, it's usually something novel, something unusual, something attention grabbing, could, could involve like starting in the middle of the action, could be like a little teaser of what's to come, but usually there's something that kind of grabs us right away that we go, wow. I want to learn more about this. I want to keep watching. So all these things, what they're doing is they're helping the story build tension, which keeps an audience's attention long enough for narrative transportation to take place. Again, that's where you lose yourself in the story. That's where you lose your samness or your, your, your sense of self, and you feel totally connected to the story's characters. So moving forward, I just want you to pay attention as you watch Jordan's video. What's the hook? What's the conflict? What does he desire beyond what he already has? And, you know, use this to understand um, the stories that you, you engage with. And I hope that it's, it's, 
useful for you. And if you're interested in telling your own story or helping to amplify the stories of others, I hope that these will serve as a useful tool in that way. Yeah, I'm gonna pull up Jordan's video. Minute, sorry, juggling. I've had the opportunity to do some pretty incredible things in my life, but I'm setting out on my greatest adventure yet, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest freestanding mountain on the planet, and summoning her on my 35th birthday. I'm hoping to cap off a decade-long journey towards happiness and healing while giving back to the community that saved my life. I'm ready to prove that there's so much more to life beyond survival. Four thirty in the morning on January twenty fourth. It is summit day. So it's time. It's been a wild ride getting here almost two years, but today's the day. We get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm pretty proud of myself. It's a bit cliche, but you really can't do anything you put your mind to. My foot's bleeding. Keep saying this looks like the moon. This looks like the moon. But this looks like the moon. Perfect. Eight days and we are very close to the highest point in Africa. As I saw the summit off in the distance and I walked toward it, the time slowed down. I felt this tidal wave of accomplishment, pride, relief, and joy. Happy birthday, dear Jordan. Happy birthday, It's so easy to be complacent in life, but I don't want my mark on this earth to be surviving my childhood. That's not enough for me. I've got the survival part down pat. It's time to live. We made it. Day eight, champion. very satisfied. I've seen what I came to see. <laughs> Let's hope I make it through this freezing cold windy night. Good night. Good night. And I did it. It's over. I made it. Kilimanjaro Expedition Challenge is done. Getting to the summit of Kilimanjaro is all mental. That's it. It's been wild. You are good. You are good. You are good, friend. This last 10 days has been absolutely incredible, transformative, life changing, amazing, all that great stuff. There's something about being on this mountain for the last 10 days. It's really spoke to me. Two, three, cheers. I've loved every minute of this whole experience. All of it, it's been awesome.
Healing from trauma isn't always achieved from your therapist's couch. Experience is an essential piece of that puzzle. It elicits a profound and lasting change. I'm charged with a whole new energy. As I get further away from my old life, I begin to realize that this is how it should be. I'm still standing. I've made my mark. I was here. So go climb your mountain. It's worth it. I promise. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, hey, Jordan and Drew, we're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule, so you guys can each take a little bit more time. Okay, great. So <clears throat> um, that was just the um, last five minutes or so of, of um, the whole, it's about a 20 minute little short documentary I made. Um, you can watch it on our website, menhealing.org. Um, so the whole journey started out as me trying to climb a mountain. Um, it turned into way more than that. You can see by the um, bit of the trailer at the beginning of that, uh, at the beginning of the excerpt there, there was a whole lot of other things. I spent a whole lot of time with a Maasai tribe and I did a whole lot of other stuff besides climbing the mountains. So the thing turned into way more than I expected. Anyway, go watch it. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, why did I do this? Why did I take on one of the seven summits of the world and make a video about it? Um, and the whole adventure sort of started uh, because of two main things. One, I had this deep desire to give back to the community, like I said, to the community that quite literally saved my life. I wanted to do something. Um, I wanted to do something tangible. I wanted to raise money to help others receive the kind of help that I have to do the kind of things that I'm able to do now. Because without people, without the people and the services like Men Healing that held my hand through my recovery, I wouldn't be where I am today. The second thing is I wanted to inspire. Um, we've talked, Jim talked about this at the beginning, and I wanted to inspire, that's a, this again is twofold. I wanted to inspire allies, survivor allies, to understand the value of recovery and to support those initiatives like the one, like Men Healing. But more, maybe more importantly, I wanted to inspire other survivors themselves to do more with their lives. I wanted to prove that sexual abuse survivors can be so much more than just survivors. Um, we can move beyond survival. In my, in my experience talking to uh, so many survivors over the, year, over the years, um, many survivors get to a place in their recovery where they're okay where they become just okay. And I'm not here to tell anyone how to live their life, but for me, being okay isn't enough. I need to dis disrupt that feeling. We all wear this sort of badge um, of, sur of survivor, uh, but I don't think we can label ourselves necessarily. Being a survivor for me was only a small part of my story. Um, I didn't want it to be the main event any longer. <clears throat> and that's a big part of why I decided to do this. I wanted to move beyond just being a survivor. I didn't want to, for so long, I sort of, <clears throat> you know, I led this horrible, these horrible years in my life, and then I went through recovery, but then my life just seemed to be just about recovery, and I was like this poster boy for being a survivor, and that started to get on my nerves. I didn't want to be known as Jordan the survivor anymore. There's so much more to me than, than that. So <clears throat> I wanted to prove that I can go on and lead a rich, we all can go on and read and lead these full enriched lives. We can go on adventures. We can do things that we have never, that we've only dreamed of and we ne uh, thought that we never could maybe do. My dream was to climb a mountain. I'm an outdoorsy, adventure kind of guy. And growing up, I was never... You know, I see these uh, National Geographic documentaries and this BBC stuff, and I'm like, that's awesome. I wish I was Indiana Jones, but I'm never going to be able to do that. And 
when I sat down and I started <clears throat> to think about what can I do that's going to both serve me and serve the community I'm trying to help. And I, and I, I was watching a mountaineering documentary uh, about Maru or something. And I said, oh, these guys are so amazing. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go climb a mountain and I'm going to do it for charity. And then I, yeah, I, I made a commitment and I stuck to it and I spent a year fundraising. Um, and I didn't want this dream to die. And I, I held my guns and I didn't let, it took me two and a half years <laughs> to get to Africa. But <clears throat> um, the, the issue was, is that I couldn't just talk anymore about being awesome and, and going through recovery and stuff like that. Cause I was, that's what I was doing for a long time. So my dream was to climb this mountain and I wanted to show that, but if I was going to talk the talk, I needed to walk the walk. And so I spent two years training, raising money, and then I headed out to East Africa to do it. And bringing it back to what Sam was discussing earlier, um, I knew that if I wanted to make an impact with this, that this story needed to be compelling. Um, and Sam was saying, pay attention to the conflict and the desire and everything within, within my video. If you go watch the whole thing, you'll get a lot more out of it. But there was two central conflicts that were naturally there. One, sort of the immediate um, one that's obvious is Jordan versus the mountain. Physically, Kilimanjaro ain't easy. Um, it, take, it took eight days to reach the summit. I, walked, I hiked through five climate zones from a jungle at the bottom to ice and snow at the top. There's rain, there's hail, there's blazing heat, there's freezing cold, lack of sleep, you're nauseous, you can't breathe. And then there's the altitude, which makes all of that 10 times worse. It's Jordan versus the mountain. And then the second thing is Jordan versus Jordan. I needed to prove both to myself and in turn prove to everyone else that I can do this. <clears throat> and that my story didn't stop at surviving my childhood. Um, my story is continuing and ongoing and I wanted to show that. So I chose to climb a mountain. And this again is sort of Two a, simply the dream of mine. Um, something I always wanted to do, never thought I could. And second of all, uh, I, I've, I've had the opportunity to travel a lot in my life and um, I've really found that adventure is healing. For me, it inherently involves a certain level of risk, stress, mental and physical challenge. It compels uh, self-awareness, body awareness, trust, interpersonal skills, problem solving. All of those things promote growth and confidence and empowerment. And uh, when all those uh, cylinders are firing at once, you get this crazy uh, energy and change inside you. Uh, adventure has the ability to sort of tap into all the good and all the bad. Um, and <clears throat> it's, it becomes this like microcosm of your healing journey of who you were, who you are, and who you're becoming. And it kind of gels for me. I mean, everybody's different, but for me. Um, so for me, it was important that I needed to show that. I wanted to show what is working for me and my story so that others might watch that and say, hey, that's working for that guy. It can work for me in my own way. So, in the end, it was a success. I threw caution to the wind and I said, screw it. I'm gonna raise as much money as I can. I'm gonna do this. And the, thing, the thing was, success. I successfully summited it. I summited the mountain. I raised $10,000 for Men Healing, which um, I donated directly back into the Financial Assistance Fund, um, which ensures that more men are going to be able to attend our weekends of recovery and tell their own stories and help them heal. Um, and actually it ended up the entire project, uh, and it ended with me being on the men healings board of directors. So now I have the opportunity to continue to find creative and exciting ways to bring these men's stories and their faces and their hearts out of the shadows and into a place where 
we can all appreciate and learn from them. So <clears throat> for me, it was putting my story on display in as I'm a dramatic guy, so um, and as dramatic way as possible, <laughs> really um, was my best option. And it, it's like Sam was talking about, it's cathartic for me. This is just my healing story continued, the sequel. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Mr. Drew. Thanks, Jordan. Um, it's interesting as I'm, as I'm hearing you all share your stories, um, I just want to point out that we, we didn't rehearse this or we didn't, uh, we had some planning meetings, but we did not really share on a detailed level um, what we were going to share. Um, and so I'm learning so much about Jordan and Sam and Jim today. And it's interesting how many parallels I'm seeing in what I planned to share and what's been shared. Um, so I think there's, I'm just looking for those themes there. Um, and I, I, th I think it's important to say that, you know, childhood abuse was not the end of my story. It doesn't need to be the end of anyone's story. Um, my life story continues and it feels long, feels limitless and it feels exciting. Um, since that late night, four years ago, I've graduated with a doctoral degree. I now work as a psychiatric nurse practitioner with veterans. I recently bought my first home. I am so determined to make it a, a safe haven for myself. Um, and yes, I did cross skydiving off my bucket list. Um, and in an interesting full circle moment, um, another feature of great stories is that last year I was able to join Oprah's audience for her Finding Neverland special, also about male survivors. Um, so I thought that was interesting to share. Um, and just listening to Jordan, um, in very interesting timing. I was invited to go camping with a friend. I hardly ever go camping, but um, during COVID, what else do you do, right? So if you have some time, you try to get out into nature. So I'm going to go camping. Uh, I'm going to leave later this evening and for about 10 years now, I have wanted to burn court documents, police records that had to do with my abuse and I've not done it yet. So I have been sitting over here in my home in Salt Lake city going back and forth about whether or not I am going to take that stuff up with me up the mountain like Jordan's mountain and just burn the crap out of it. Um, so I think I'm going to do that today. That's, that's another chapter in my story. Um, and I hope to feel as liberated and free as Jordan felt when he reached the summit. Um, and while I can't rewrite what happened to me as a child, I can choose to write and share the stories of my life in ways that uh, honor who I am and help others to take back control of their own stories. I feel like I am, I still have good days and bad days, but I feel like I'm beyond surviving and now I'm actively thriving. I feel such a push to embrace giving back as I've been given. So I wanna thank you for listening to my story today. And I wanna thank my brothers at Men Healing, Sam, Jordan, and Jim, for inviting me to be part of your stories. Uh, it's an honor. Um, and if I may speak on your behalf, I would say that we're undoubtedly stronger together. So I'll pass it on to Sam. Thanks, Drew. The feeling's mutual, man. I was watching that video of you earlier and watching you watch your video made me, it brought me so much joy. And I felt that I saw on your face this like sense of pride at like who you have become since you decided to, to tell your story and to stop hiding and start living. And um, it just, I'm super proud of you too. I'm proud of all of us, so. Um, yeah, I just, 
Oh, this is so great. Um, all right, well, I'm supposed to share a little bit about um, where I'm at on my healing journey now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a couple of weekends of recovery now. Um, been in therapy a couple of years. Um, I, you know, speaking at this conference, I think that in this very public way feels like a big step for me personally. Um, you know, it's just, it's, so thank you to everyone who's, who's here listening because um, it just, it feels big to be heard, you know, in this way. So thank you for your presence. Um, I'm still involved with um, Men Healing. We're, we're working on um, a couple of video projects right now um, uh, to get their kind of put a face to their facilitators. So folks that are um, maybe on the fence about whether or not they want to attend a week in recovery can get an idea. This is who's going to be here. Um, and this is what they're like. And oh, look, they're not so scary after all. Um, I, um, along with Drew, I'm, I'm part of a, a study that's researching the effects of um, like motivational interviewing and, and this sort of like specific curriculum um, the effects of that curriculum on uh, male, ident uh, male identifying sexual and gender minority uh, folks who are um, uh, survivors of, of sexual abuse and just carrying, you know, carrying on. Um, so it's just, uh, it's hard to describe I don't, I don't know what's, what's next on this, uh, this journey for me, but I'm very proud of where I have gotten. And um, yeah, it just feels like a real, a real gift. Um, I saw a, a question just because we have a couple of, um, oh, actually, no, I'll come back to this later. I'm so sorry, Jim, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, we should have some time right at the end there because we go to, yeah. to, to a 12, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Um, what, what I just want to add, yeah, I am so proud to be working with this organization. And I hope part of what everybody can see is we are trying to be an organization that has a soul. We are trying to be an organization that through our relationships, that it really shows how collaboration caring, loving, kindness, respect um, can make a difference. Because it's not just about the work. I think so many of us that work in different agencies with these issues, there's burnout, there's incredible fatigue, there's the overwhelmness. And what I'm really, really enjoying about Men Healing and hope we continue is that everybody is energized and spirited. And we're not trying to be a corporate top-down kind of an organization it's the people that make the work and as we build our survivor community what we're trying to do is the people we serve are not just uh, caseloads they're not just numbers they're not just tabulations but we're really trying to proliferate relationships and i think what you can maybe see here is just in the examples of the four of us hierarchy kind of begins to change relationships begin to dominate and we begin to form out of the experiences that we have with each other. And the board, there's several board members here today as well. Um, we actually do joint work between the board and the team. So there's not a traditional hierarchy. And the board does the same work as the team is doing. And we really get in there with our own stories and we know who we are. So I think we're talking about film and video, we're talking about public presentations, but I also think developing relationships in our organizations where we know who we are and our stories is very, very compelling way to do the work. And I know for me, that's why 45 years later, I'm not going to retire. This is too much joy and too much satisfaction. And I hope I can be hauled out when the end comes on the day I'm doing this work. So that's 
kind of the spirit and the energy that goes with this because the stories are the linkage. And I want to stay till the end of the movie. So that's um, kind of the way I view the work and what I view we're doing. So thank you all for being here. One of the things that we try to blend into the weekend when we're helping the men learn to tell their story is the role of witness is just as important as telling your story because we haven't been listened to. So we need to have the skill of listening and hearing that is so powerful to have where you just take time, forget about what you're going to say next, don't do it, and just listen. That's part of storytelling, taking it in and being there because people feel the difference when they're being heard. They feel the difference when it really makes a difference and it's not just uh, obligatory. So that's the other side of storytelling that, that I think is really important. So thanks you to all of you who've been here in that way. And Sam, you wanted to offer some closing things and maybe deal with the question there? We've got about 10 minutes. Just one quick uh, yeah. housekeeping thing. If anyone yeah. wants to go into Jim and all of their Q&A, please yeah. let me know in the chat or by a thumbs up. Oh, and let me add one more thing before I do the platform. Please visit our website. You can access the Beyond Survival videos there. We have the bunch. Subscribe to our newsletter. Every couple of weeks, we send out information about what we're doing. And we're really, really excited. We're just signing uh, an agreement with the Men's Story Project to launch a TED Talk-like program that will start in January at a national level to uh, begin to tell male survivors, help the men tell their stories like we're doing here. We're going to plan a whole series of them while we're all locked down in COVID. So we'll have uh, online presence and then we'll translate them into in-person events when it is safe to do so. But I'm really excited. The whole project is going to be about helping men coach them to tell their stories in ways that are compelling and engaging. So you'll get news about that if you get on a subscriber list to see how that's being launched. Sam? Thanks, Drew, Sam, and Jordan for being part of this. Thank you, Jim. I mean, I honestly don't have that much more to add. Um, I, I think, you know, one thing to think about with all this um, is, you know, it is both, you know, and I think Jim got at this earlier too, like, as important as, as it is to listen to other people's stories, and again, that is very important. It's also really important to know and understand your own story in a deep way. And I would just like, I would encourage each of you to think about what is at stake for you in this work? What is the thing that you desire? What is getting in the way of that desire? how can you get creative about you know overcoming that i think sometimes it can be actually really empowering to look at your own story in that it, to frame it as a narrative um it may not be useful or right for everyone but um and for a lot of, a lot of people it's kind of hard to see that in yourself but i just encourage you to sit with that and um you can ask other people to help you out, which is the, the beauty of this. Um, there's like a little exercise. Um, one of the other organizations that I'm involved with is a, a group here in Chicago called the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs. And they talk a lot about one-on-one, uh, -on -one, which is like a, a kind of traditional community organizing method where you really sit with somebody and just talk to them, set aside an hour, talk and, and and listen carefully. Um, it's not that you're asking somebody outright, like, what do you desire? Or like, what's the main conflict in your life? Because a lot of times people don't know um, or can be like a little put off by that. You know, it's, it's a winding river, right? It's a conversation that, you're, that you can have with them um, and allow, you know, sh react for real when they're sharing with you. You can share um, s some of your own stories with them. And that usually opens the door for somebody else to then share something with you. Um, you know, these are the kinds of ways that you can kind of uncover, you know, at the same time, you can like be listening carefully to somebody else's story and maybe helping them in some way. Um, and you you might also learn something new about yourself. So 
that's something kind of fun that you can try. Um, and I just want to add, you don't have to make like fancy or expensive videos to tell a great story. Um, just look for whatever forum, you know, wherever that applies in your life or in your uh, business. Um, look for those opportunities to share your story and to listen to the stories of others. Um, and, and it's not just a story of where you've been, but where are you going, right? What's the collective story we are all creating as a society? So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and bring up, I'll kick it back to Jim for the last few minutes here. Uh, do you want to just put us in the breakout room early, Deborah? Or would you? Um, you know, I made the breakout room and people can go early, but I just uh, wanted to say thank you. And thank you all for sharing your stories. There's been many a times while you're presenting that I was choked up. You know, um, this conference was made because I am married to a survivor. Mm -hmm. And if people who know me know I can't do anything small, it's go big or go home, right? And he didn't think I heard him. Mm -hmm. And so I made this conference so people listen. Mm -hmm. And I think today you made people listen even more. Mm -hmm. And I wanna thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And so it touched my heart. And as you can see, I was cheering and I was jumping <laughs> you were telling your stories because I like to feel what other people feel. And I was just so proud to know you and be a part of this and to be on the board of Men Healing and you blew me away. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and I also thank you, Deborah, for being on our board now. And two other people, Michael Munson and Joanna Cobra, and I saw they're yeah. both board members that are there. We have the most amazing board um, and Again, what's different than a lot of organizations that I'm used to, the board actually likes each other and has fun <laughs> together. <laughs> and we, we're playful. What a and novel so, idea. <laughs> I know, it's a novel idea. And um, yeah, we're, we're really trying to promote that. Deborah is really a part because she likes to have fun and helps to influence with that. So thank you. And thanks for inviting us to be here. Every year, you're Thank part you of the ever. family now. So you will be back. I will be knocking on your door. And, and <laughs> it's not a four knock because I yeah. see you once a month. Yeah, but, you know, this is just, it's amazing. And I believe everybody was moved and touched mm -hmm. by this whole thing. And so, right. yeah, I'm blown away. Mm -hmm. So all, right. everyone who wants to be in a Q&A, just let me know. But I have put them in the Q&A. Um, and our next speaker is here. And um, again, okay. Applause for all of this and thank you Thanks, for telling Deborah. us your story. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And my little son wants to now hike the mountain.